I am so excited. I, I've been on, I've actually, <laughs> I have holiday brain. I have been away for a few weeks. I keep saying on holidays, technically our honeymoon, which is probably <laughs> like <laughs> the correct way to say that because I keep saying, yeah, I've just been on holidays, but I've come back. And you know when you get back from a good break and you don't remember what your job is or like how to log into your computer, any of your passwords, I'm still there. We've been back for two weeks, not ideal. So tonight could be very interesting. I've not uh, shared in like three months, so who knows where this is gonna go. But I'm excited because I feel like God always puts things on my heart to share that are not easy to get people excited about. I feel like recently I've preached on self-control and humility and discipline and like the room is just cheering with excitement when you tell them that that's what they're gonna be learning about that night. But tonight I have rest. And I'm like, finally, God, you've given me, now I'm going to be the favorite pastor. Sorry, Pastor Chris. Sorry, Pastor Sue. Sorry, Pastor Levi. You can't top a message about rest. Like God wants you to nap. Amen. God wants you to take a break. Yes, please. Like this is as good as it gets. So I'm very excited. And I hope you're very excited because I just think who doesn't want rest? I don't know, I know, actually, I know one person who never says they want rest. My husband believes you will sleep when you die, and so you should just do everything, like, all the time. But most of us believe in rest. We look forward to a break. We look forward to the weekend. We, I mean, public holiday coming up. If you're like me, you, like, schedule them out a year in advance, and you work out where you can take your annual leave to take advantage of all the public holidays. I really love rest, but if I'm honest the way, or if I'm honest about what I observe when I look around, I don't see a lot of quality rest happening in people's lives, a genuine rest. I think it's become quite elusive. I think we talk about it a lot, but even when we rest, it feels so short-lived. It's always quite sad to finish a holiday, to realize it's Monday tomorrow, to realize we're going back to work. I feel like our rest can be so short-lived. And you know, topics that I feel like are talked about all the time, ironically, are burnout and then self-care and then work-life balance, but the hustle and then the side hustle. And there's all these opposing ideas, I think all vying for our attention and they're gearing towards either promoting us in life, wherever we are, getting to the next level, or paying us generally so we can buy more things or consume or live a different lifestyle. You know, we spend all this time accumulating positions and accolades and things. And I've noticed that because of this culture, I don't see a lot of deep rest around me. I don't experience that much deep rest. And because in recent years, you know, I think we're all trying to achieve that work-life balance that, you know, there's a new book out on every week about the secrets to it and someone's finally discovered how to do it. Because I find myself worried that if I stop, I'm not working hard enough and I'm not being intentional and I'm not being disciplined. And if I stop, I feel guilty about all the things that I'm not doing But then when I'm doing them, I'm so exhausted and busy and rushed that life just goes by and I find myself discontented. And this balance eludes me. I don't know if anyone else has perfected it yet, but I find myself encouraged to wanna do the things I love seven days a week. Or especially I find a common thing when you're at church, it feels like the right thing to be involved every day of the week. But if I'm honest, even in the space of church, that exhausts me. That can lead to a lack of refreshing. That can burn you out just as easily as working seven days a week anywhere else. And I wonder if you've ever felt that pressure or the urge to rush in life, stressed to stop, not knowing how or when, and just wishing that the world could just be put on pause for a second. Like time wouldn't keep going. I'd take a break if time could stand still and I wouldn't miss out on anything. And that would be an appropriate, that would be a great time to take a break. But unfortunately the world keeps tracking on 
time is moving forward. And I think so many of us just don't make a space for rest. And add on top of that, social media, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we see the lives of others and we're encouraged to want more, to do more, to be more, ironically to holiday more and work harder to holiday more and holiday in the right places and with all the right things and even the desire to holiday leads people into a frenzy of stress and work and restlessness. And I think inspiration is a beautiful thing. I think looking forward to build your life and create the life that you want is very important. But oftentimes I don't think that that's what we're getting out of social media so much as comparison, a comparison, comparison and discontentment. I combined them, but we go with it. That could be a new word. Um, and even just a sense of lack that drives us to want to do more. And John Mark Comer describes the current culture. He says, we're living in a culture of accomplishment and accumulation. We find ourselves in these two camps and accumulation sort of rings a bell that that might not be the best way to live because it sounds like materialism and things, but accomplishment, how could that be a bad thing? How could studying and achieving and being promoted be the wrong thing? And you know, there's actually a new disease being diagnosed called hurry sickness. Has anyone heard of this? Hurry sickness. It's being um, diagnosed by psychologists. It's a behavior pattern characterized by continual rushing and anxiousness and a continuous struggle, unremitting or never relaxing attempt to accomplish or achieve more and more things or participate in more and more events in less and less time. So our culture is so bad at resting that there's now an illness called hurry sickness, that people are actively being diagnosed in this idea that we cannot stop rushing about life to fit as much as we can in. And it seems like not a bad desire. Who doesn't want to make the most out of this life? Jesus tells us to live a full life, but somewhere along the way, we've missed something. Because as much as he calls us to a full life, I don't think he's called us to a life where we're being diagnosed with hurry sickness, where we're just chasing and chasing and chasing and never finding a rest. It's just unhealthy for us. And so we have this society that seems desperate to find rest, but desperate to find achievement and accomplishment, a society that wants self-care, but wants to hustle, a society that cannot make up its mind. And it makes me wonder if it's just that we don't actually know how to find a lasting rest. But I have good news, as I said. And in Matthew 11, 28 to 30, Jesus says this, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And there's a paraphrase of this by Eugene Peterson in the message that says this, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you will recover your life. I'll show you how to take real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and live lightly. That to me is what I want. I wanna live freely and live lightly. I don't wanna live stressed and burdened. I wanna be able to come to Jesus and experience this life that he says that we can have. And the good news is that Jesus comes to offer rest, not just for your body. He's not just saying, make sure you sit down every now and then, but for your soul, for the deep parts, for the, thing, the parts of you that the world could never ever hope to bring rest to. And some of you right now, I'm sure, are weary and burdened by a restless life. And you're searching for something to ease that. And I, 
I just want to encourage you tonight that the answer is going to be found in Jesus. And I really want to share a few thoughts about developing a spirit of restfulness through um, specifically practicing of the Sabbath, which I don't think is something that we really talk a lot about um, these days. It's kind of an ancient thing left in an ancient time, but more and more I've noticed in my life people actively embracing the Sabbath and I've seen the benefits and I've just started practicing it myself and I think there's something in it that brings a rest to the soul that you just can't get anywhere else. And so we're going to talk about that tonight and maybe look at a few um, observations around it, how we can implement it in our life. Um, and I just think the main question is like, do you want that? Do you want a life instead of having to run somewhere desperate for rest every time you get burnt out? Or would you rather be able to walk in a spirit of restfulness every single day in a pattern, following after Jesus, stepping into the life that he offers? Um, and I'm sure most of us <laughs> would say yes, yes, please. Um, and I had honest, <laughs> this is in my notes because I thought it was hilarious, but I thought to connect with the younger demographic as I am very swiftly these days edging away from the younger demographic, I thought a secondary title for this message could be Batty's Sabbath. And do with that what you will. I had to Google what it meant to make sure it wasn't inappropriate. But I feel like it works on a few levels. If anyone enjoys music from a while ago, there's a double pun in there. Um, but, you know, I love a good joke. So even though that sounded like forced laughter, I'll take it. Um, <laughs> but as I was talking about the Sabbath, I feel like it's not the most common of things that we speak about or practice um, or have the best awareness around. Um, essentially, I'm sure the basics that a lot of us might know is the Sabbath was considered the day of rest. There's this one day of rest in scripture that's referenced. And so we're going to look at a few scriptures of where it first got introduced, first got commanded, and then how Jesus implemented it himself, and then talk about what the Sabbath looks like from there. So we're going to start in Genesis because that is the beginning of the Sabbath. It happened very early on in Scripture. So for six days, I'm sure we've all heard the story, God creates the heavens and the earth. He forms the world as we know it, fills it with creatures of all kinds, with vegetation, with plants. He spends six days creating what we know as the universe what we know and <laughs> everything that we haven't been able to find yet. But on the seventh day, he rests. In Genesis 2 verses 1 to 3, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating he had done. So at the foundation of the world... A day is set apart and made holy because there was rest on it. And holy in that context, it just means for something different. It was set apart for a specific purpose, to rest. And so it's built into, if you think of it this way, the fabric of creation and the way that God operates, that there is this rhythm to life. There's creation and there's rest. And the seventh day is the only day that it says that God blessed. Everything was good. God made it and it was good. God made it and it was good. But on the seventh day, because he rested, there was blessing in that. And so it's unique to all the other days and should make us pay attention. And so that's the very beginning, way back, whoever knows when. And then we have the Ten Commandments which is another key place in scripture where we hear about the Sabbath. And so the Ten Commandments, Moses shares with the Israelites after they're set free from Egypt, after generations and generations of slavery. And in Exodus 20 verses 8 to 11, it says this, this is the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, set apart for a specific purpose. 
Six days you shall labor and do your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And so in this commandment, we see it referencing the creation story, probably a story through uh, verbal history was something that they might have been familiar with. This relates back to God who rested. But one of the key things to keep in mind in Exodus is that this is being spoken to a people who've just left hundreds of years of slavery. They don't know how to operate as people and they've not been treated as human. They're learning how to go forth as a nation once more. And this is one of the important things that God puts before them, along with how to conduct themselves as people, how to engage work. How important would it be for someone leaving slavery to understand that work in and of itself is not a bad thing? When you've been mistreated in such a way, God is restoring it by pointing back to creation, saying, I worked. Work is good. Work is what God does, and I created you in my image. But there's even better news. He also created for you a holy rest that in every seven days you could experience his goodness, his creation with no work, with no labor, with no toil, having to do nothing to earn the love of God. This would have been mind-blowing for people. You know, I've Read a, uh, I listened to a great podcast that said we have turned the Ten Commandments into something much more serious than it would have been to these people who learnt for the first times that they could live in a society where people wouldn't take what was theirs, people wouldn't kill the people they loved, people wouldn't steal their partners. The, we look at them and we think, gee, these Ten Commands that people have to do, this would have been a people set free a people who realized there was a whole new way to live. And as part of that, God references again, his holy rest set before them. But throughout scripture, throughout time, because of how long it is, it loses a bit of its, I think, original intention. You know, between Moses and Jesus, they'd say there's roughly 1,500 years. That is a long time, (laughs) like a very long time. That's such an ancient people, even compared to who the people were in Jesus' day and age. And so when Jesus comes and engages the scripture and teaches on Sabbath, it is very important to listen to how he applied them. Because what we know about Jesus is that he is the final authority of scripture. He's Jesus in, he's God in full. And the way that he applied scripture is much more important than the specifics of what the scripture that came before said. He has that authority. You've heard it said this, but I'm telling you this. And so we need to make sure we listen to what Jesus says because the Sabbath becomes a religious practice that people are punished for not obeying, that people are killed for not keeping. And I do not think that that was ever the intention of God when he created this beautiful thing. But we're a broken people, we do our best to interpret things. And there was once a time where we thought if we did not meet every expectation of God, we would not be well with him, we would not be saved, and we had to do works to impress God, to be on the right side of God, to make sure we did well in life. But then Jesus comes and we learn there's a whole new way to live and that Jesus loves you irrelevant (laughs) of how well you keep these things. And so this is what he says about the Sabbath in one experience. In Mark uh, 2, verses 23 to 11, uh, 23 to 11 to 27, it says, One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples walked along. They began to pick some of the grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? And he answered, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. 
And then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so the son of man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. And so it was Jesus' custom to keep the Sabbath, to go to the temple. He was a Jewish boy in Jewish tradition. But what he clearly points out in the scripture is that the Sabbath is first and foremost a gift to man. He says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. We were not put here to take a break every seven days just because God needs us to. This is a gift. This is something he gave to us. This is a holy, set-apart practice to experience rest in a way that we just can't experience on our own. And so Jesus takes what's been pushed into religious practice and brought it back to the beauty of a gift from the God who created the entire universe, who wanted you to be able to experience rest. He never withheld a single thing from us. And, you know, I think it's a gift that many of us just don't engage, mostly because maybe it's just fallen to the wayside. It's not been as particularly relevant, but I do really think that the Sabbath is something that is a gift that we can choose to engage. And during, we were doing the flourishing series for a while. Um, It's one of my favorite series we did this year because it made me stop and realize that there is a lot of things that Jesus offers us that is an invitation that we may or may not choose to accept. Like I think a lot of us don't understand the actual life that Jesus hands to us. He has withheld nothing from us. He has told us how we can live a rich and a full life. But so many of us stop at salvation. So many of us stop at saying yes to Jesus, to accepting us, to loving us, but not necessarily to transforming us, to follow in his footsteps. He says in that verse, um, keep company with me, walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. And so to flourish in this space, he hasn't withhold anything from us. He's shown us, walk with me. Jesus kept the Sabbath, do as I do. Okay, it's not a religious practice that you have to observe every single little thing or you're gonna be in trouble, but it is a gift and it will benefit your life. And I'd be surprised if any of us here had a more important mission than Jesus may have had (laughs) to uh, think that it's not as important as it is. But just some quick observations and then we'll get into the how. But one observation that I wanna share is that the Sabbath offers rest on a cosmic level. And I mostly just really love the word cosmic, just because I don't hear it a lot. But I just wanna take the time to point out that on the Sabbath, it's not simply about not working but about directing your thoughts towards God on that day. So not only are you not working and you're resting, but you're resting in the presence of God, knowing that he does not need you to achieve a single thing to love you and to provide for you and to be there for you. Where on earth can you get that sword of rest deep in your soul that the creator of the universe takes no issue with you. He loves you. He delights in you so much that he didn't just create this world for you to work and build in, but to sit and enjoy and just be and exist and do the things that you love and that he delights in us when we rest. We're not just worker bees. We're not just here to labor but we're here to enjoy his creation simply because he's that good. And so I don't know where in the world you could go and experience any form of rest. I'm sure there are some great spas in luxurious locations that cost billions of dollars to go to, and I'm sure they're great, but that does nothing for your soul, not on a deep, deep, deep level like we all know we have. And so there's this cosmic rest, this deep rest where we get to trust in the affection and the unconditional love of God and just enjoy. I just think it's the most beautiful picture of God, so counter to ancient 
history stories of who gods were and what they expected of men to build the world for them, to make monuments to them. We have a God who delights when we just rest and enjoy his goodness. And so there's an element of gratitude to it. But the Sabbath is also an opportunity for trust. Can you take your hands off the wheel and trust that it's gonna be okay? Can you choose not to hustle and do every single thing you can seven whole days a week and know that you will still have provision, that there are things more important than building your own life, your own wealth, your own accomplishments, that Jesus has extended an invitation to you to sit in a holy rest What could be more important than that? Whether it's that you trust that you can do it and still provide, or whether you trust that there's as much meaning in it as Jesus presents that there is. I think throughout scripture, it is obvious that this is something that God has created uniquely, that Jesus engaged in, and that is spoken in scripture so often that it would be silly to think that it didn't have value. But can we trust that even if we don't understand the value, that it is there, that it's something that we can engage in and that we won't miss out. I don't think that God would offer us something that would cost us our future or our potential or the purpose that he's placed within us. If he's created this good thing for us, it is not gonna cost us the life he has for us. If anything, we are gonna step further into that life as we trust him and as we're faithful. And like God wants you to take a day off and relax and have fun and rest. And how good is that? That he extends that to you while filling your life with great purpose, while filling you with great potential, while having incredible plans for your life. Can you trust that you're not gonna miss out when you engage in this. And the third thought I just wanna touch on is that the Sabbath still highlights the importance of work. You know, I think a lot of options that we have around how to finally rest is generally like make a billion dollars overnight and then retire at 23 and then you will rest. And it's like, well, yes, that's probably true. I'd probably be relaxed if I was a billionaire and retired at 23, but Even then, I'm not sure that you would find that much. You'd probably be restless. What are you gonna do for the rest of your life? But the Sabbath highlights the importance of work. It is one day to six days. We have six days to passionately and productively build and create our lives where we can work hard and actually not be afraid to work hard because we know there's rest coming and it's coming for us whenever we need it. It keeps coming. It's not this one day and you're done. Every seven days, every seven days, every seven days, the Sabbath rest is there for you when you need it. And so I can chase after my dreams. I can build this life. I can give everything to God. I can work hard. I can do all of these things and not worry because I know that my rest is coming. And I think that when we have the consistent habit of the Sabbath, when we actually know this is something we do, this is something we prioritize, that spirit of restfulness doesn't just live in the Sabbath. It extends through our week. It means that on the Monday, the Tuesday, the Wednesday, whatever days it is, you know there's rest coming. You've been in rest. You've spent time just being grateful to God for that rest and now you get to build. Now you get to do something full of purpose and meaning in a whole new way. You get to sit in silence and I don't know, do whatever you wanna do on the Sabbath that day and know that God loves you. And then you get to get to work. You get to do all the things that God has placed within you, chase after dreams and just actually experience your potential. And I think it actually builds up in me an excitement to work, knowing that I have this rest to go to when I need it. And the how is quite simple. <laughs> I, I really loved spending a lot of time, I guess, kind of researching and in, engaging a lot of content about Sabbath, because even I like, have not had the biggest experience with what it looks like. And what I loved about everything that I listened to and what I read in the Bible is that the whole point is not that you would be stressed about how to Sabbath. That would kind of defeat 
the point. Um, it's not a rule. There's not a set list. This is not the day where God gives you a to-do list and you specifically do that. The how is quite simple. And the best or the most, um, the easiest to remember method that I heard was by, a, oh, sorry, that was my timer. So now everyone knows <laughs> that I'm going over. Um, but the best motto that I found was that, and he was saying he shares, it, he's got little girls, like five or six. And so he's like, we needed something fun, something they could remember. And he says this, he said, on the Sabbath, we rest, we have fun, there's no work and God loves us. So his little kids can repeat that verbatim. They know on the Sabbath, we rest, we have fun, there's no work and God loves us. And I just think you could make it more complex, but I just don't think it needs to be. On the Sabbath, you rest. There is no work. You're not worried about the things of the week, trying to accomplish, trying to build. You relax and you have fun. What do you love to do? What is something that you look forward to? What is something about this world that you can enjoy? Because God loves it when we delight in creation and the things that are around us. What is it that you love? Have fun, do something exciting, do something relaxing and know and be reminded that God loves you in that space, that he delights in you as you rest and as you enjoy. And, I, and I've got to tell you, I haven't been practicing Sabbath for the longest time, but we just walk past. <laughs> this is one of the things we do, but we just don't do the dishes now. Um, and that's such a treat. But when you walk past and you see it, you just think, I don't have to do that because God loves me and it's the Sabbath and I'm resting. And it's honestly the best thing ever. And there are some, obviously it's unique to you, you can do the dishes. I did say that to someone this morning and they were like, oh, we don't take it that far. And I was like, oh, a bit of judgment, but okay. But the idea is, um, one of the guys said, for example, he said he loves to make his bed every day because he's a very structured, A-type OCD person. But on the Sabbath, he purposely doesn't do it and it annoys him. But when he sees it, he goes, no work, God loves me like this. I don't need to be perfect. I don't need to have it all in order. And so I think as people, I'll let you just think of your own practices, but the keys are very simple. Find a way to rest, not to labor, not to work hard. If you love being in the garden, then be in the garden. That's fun, that's how you refresh. But if you're thinking all week, oh, I've really gotta get that gardening done, maybe don't do it on the Sabbath because that doesn't sound like you're gonna enjoy it. Um, but a few frameworks, if you are someone who prefers a, a bit more structure, um, traditionally, it's a great day for um, prayer or gratitude, for family and friends, going for walks, for napping, for, for or same thing, sleeping, for feasting is a big thing, enjoying a feast. What are your favorite foods? What's your favorite dinner? Have it on the Sabbath, enjoy it. And as you eat it and think, geez, this is the best pasta I've ever had, Think about God. It's because of the Sabbath that I'm doing this. Geez, God is good. Geez, I'm so grateful that I have a God who wants me to enjoy life, who wants me to enjoy creation, and that it brings such balance to the God who also says, make the most out of your life, work hard, pick up your cross and carry me. But hey, don't, don't forget the Sabbath. Don't forget to enjoy creation. And so I'll just ask a few questions. Um, just maybe to help us get in the mind, uh, help us think about what we could do. But the first question is just, do you want a moment of rest or do you want a spirit of restfulness? Because one requires consistency, requires a practice so that you can take it day in, day out. And it's not just something you run to desperately every six months because you're on the edge. Do you want a spirit of restfulness that you can carry with you? And the second question is, do you see rest or Sabbath or margin um, in your world as an essential? Is it something you're trying to fit in wherever it kind of already fits? Or is this an essential in your life? Like I mentioned, it was Jesus' practice to Sabbath and Jesus' job was no big deal, but save all of mankind and 
it just says to me how important this is. This is an essential, this is an invitation to flourish. And the third question is, what are, what, what are you prioritizing above Sabbath rest? And I don't say that to be critical, but even just to think about what are the things that make you think that maybe you're not gonna be able to engage in this, write them down. Actually think about why you might not be able to, or think you might not be able to engage it. And just have a pray about whether you can trust God in those things. Take the time to engage that rest. His plan for you is not going to be threatened by you engaging this. And that's why the last question is just simply, do you trust that you can stop and God will provide for you? You know, I just, I just think they're great questions to ask. And I would really encourage you as old of a practice as it might sound, I do think it is unbelievably important for people here and now today to rest, not in a way that's superficial, not in a way that's over too quickly or that leaves us constantly needing more and more self-care, but in a way that's deep, in a way that Jesus has shown us is the key to resting and in a way that I think will bring so much fruit into our lives, into our soul, into our spirit. Um, And so that is my encouragement for you. And I mean, a message on rest. So that's pretty good. No hard homework. Go take a day off. Don't do your dishes. You're welcome. And I would, yeah, send Pastor Chris emails to say this was a great message. (laughs) But, (laughs) um, But, you know, while we are here, I do just want to acknowledge, like, that there might be some people here that engaging with God or even knowing what it is to be on a journey with Him is so new to you. Um, and just the idea that God maybe from this message is a bit different than how you've heard, that He wants us to rest and that He creates these special things for us because simply He loves us. And I just want to encourage you, if you are here tonight and you would like to know more about what it means to have faith or to trust God or um, to invite him into your life. We would love to um, help you with that. It's very simple. um, And we would just love to connect with you and answer any questions you have. So we'll be at the Connect Hub right after the message. Uh, But right now, I believe we've got coffees. We've got chicken tacos we've got after parties we've got good times so why don't you get up on your feet remember we're still going community's happening right here have a good night enjoy chicken tacos